I'm Hannah O'Regan. Um, I'm uh, leading the Box Office Bears project, which is on a very different topic of animal baiting in early modern England. But intriguingly enough, I will also be starting you in Southwark. Um, so there are more links than you might have thought with, with Roman Britain. OK, so uh, the Box Office Bears project. It is uh, not just me. There's a team of people working on the project. Uh, Box Office Bears, which is abbreviated to Bob. Now, Bob is um, uh, it is me. It is uh, Dr. Callan Davies, who's uh, doing the archival work. We've got Dr. Lizzie Wright, who's doing the zoo archaeology. Dr. Andy Kesson, who is a um, specialist in early modern theatre and also in performance, which is a, a key part of our of our project. And Gregor Larson, who's an ancient DNA specialist. And uh, we will also be having an ancient DNA postdoc uh, to be appointed next year. The project's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, running until uh, October 2023. So we're running up to the uh, Shakespeare First Folio Festival. And our project partners are MOLA, as MOLA have um, excavated many of the sites that I'm going to be talking about to you this evening. OK, so that's the team. That's what we're up to. But we're studying animal slash bear baiting. So what is it? Um, it's not very nice, I think is a, is a fairly uh, standard place to start. So in 1174, William Fitzstevens recorded that in London on feast days, who huge bears do battle with hounds let loose upon them. And that is basically a description of bear baiting from what, nearly 800 years ago. And so but animal baiting, it's not just bears, it's bulls, it's occasionally lions, it's all sorts of different animals, but usually a large animal pitted against multiple dogs. Um, that animal is tethered and then the dogs are um, let loose upon them, as Fitzstevens said. And here we've got an, uh, a little uh, picture from the Smithfield Decretals dating to sort of 1340. So again, a medieval example. And we've got this rather shy bear with the most wonderful claws on his paws, um, hiding behind a tree from two rather fierce looking dogs. And this is probably uh, an indication of bear baiting. And I'd also like you to note that the bear is wearing a muzzle. And that is a, um, a sort of constant when we're looking at um, uh, at imagery of bear baiting, except for the one that I'm about to show you. So this is um, said to be an image of bear baiting, but I do wonder to what extent it might be bear hunting because several of the things like the muzzle, like the stake are missing from the image. Anyway, the reason I've put this up is that when we think of early modern London, we think of the playhouses, we think of Shakespeare, we don't tend to think of blood sports. Um, and when we do, we think, oh, that's a bit odd. Um, how does that integrate with things like Hamlet and the, you know, the wonders of, of um, sort of early modern theatre? I think that's in part because we've tended not to think about the other aspects that made the life of um, early modern England very different to ours. And for those of you out there who are early modern theatre specialists, please you know, forgive me this um, exceedingly broad brush approach. So. We've got three major forms of public entertainment happening. I mean, there are there are others as well. You've got performances, you've got street performances and things, but you've all, you've got your public executions and floggings and and other judicial punishments happening in the street that you can go along and watch. You've got your plays and you've got baitings. And I think a key point here is that people will have attended all of these things. And that in fact, the executions and the floggings were free, whereas you had to pay for the baitings and the playhouses. But the playhouses and the baiting arenas were next door to one another. The people who are attending the plays are attending the baitings. There is no, there is not necessarily a separation between someone who would go to see a bear bait and someone who would go to see King Lear. Um, it is, they are the same audiences. And if we look at, um, the area where the majority of the evidence has been found, we're looking at Southwark, as I said, um, linking back to Alex's talk. Southwark, the south bank of the Thames, um, just along from where the modern reconstructive globe uh, is, we find the places where multiple bear baiting arenas were built between about 1540 and 1680. 
Now this diagram is from the Hope Playhouse volume and I've adjusted it a bit to, to put the labels on that are most um, used to me this evening. And what you can see is that there's been multiple bear gardens at different points. So there's sort of a sequence of different bear gardens, but we've also got a sequence of playhouses. Uh, and so we've got bear garden number three, we've got the Hope Theatre, we've got the Rose, we've got the Globe. As I said, the, the people attending the playhouses will be walking past the bear gardens, the people in visiting the bear gardens will be going to the playhouses, and the hope exemplifies this completely by being uh, an a uh, playhouse and arena that was built for both. It was a dual purpose uh, arena that was intended to be both for animal baiting and for playing. The playing didn't last there for very long, only for a few years, and after that it became an animal baiting arena. But that just exemplifies the fact that these two things are completely intertwined. Um, people are running them as the same, in the same buildings. The same people are running both baiting and uh, the playhouse. Now, thinking about bears in plays, they do actually turn up actual bears in plays. I mean, whether they were live bears on stage is a completely different question. But the idea of bears being present within people's lives in this early modern period is absolutely definitely there. Bears would be turning up in your towns and villages. It's not a purely London centric thing baiting, but this is where we have the best evidence. Um, and so bears are turning up in plays. And I just want to draw your attention to the bottom three which are from sort of 1610 onwards, where there's a number of, of bear plays uh, being written and performed. Now, we've got bears appearing in plays, but we also have bears being mentioned in plays. And in Merry Wives of Windsor, we have um, Sackerson mentioned. I have seen Sackerson loose 20 times and have taken him by the chain. Sackerson is a bear. And so he was famous enough to have been mentioned within this play and for people to have known what that meant. Um, now, so that's an example of one of these bears actually being mentioned. I'll get back to bears being named in a minute. But we've also got bears uh, sort of allusions to baiting, not bears themselves, but allusions to baiting in other plays. So, for example, in Macbeth here, they have tied me to a stake. I cannot fly, but bear like I must fight the course. There is you know, that is absolutely a description of bear baiting and Macbeth is is placing himself in the position of the bear at the stake. I must fight the course, an allusion to a time period in which that fight would take place. And that actually is an is an interesting point. We don't quite know how um, baiting works, you know, to what extent where the bait, where, what is being bet on and how it's being bet on. But we suspect that betting that's off the books, should we say, is happening quite a lot. And then um, in Twelfth Night, if you think about Twelfth Night, Malvolio, it is effectively baiting all the way through. People are baiting Malvolio and eventually he says, I will be revenged on the whole pack of you. They are the dogs, he is the bear. It's bear baiting illusions once again. So it's implicit in a number of different sort of cultural examples. Um, this baiting, which is going to be known to people, as I say, in every town and village across the country, bears would be turning up to be baited um, for sort of festivals and other occasions. Now, what about the animals? Well, we have um, the remains of a number of uh, different bears in, in the Southwark deposits. Uh, there's also remains of dogs and horses and bulls. And um, that's what Lizzie will be working on um, um, with our project partners, Mola, to, to look at these, um, these remains. And, you know, we can, um, we can e examine these bones and tell all sorts of things from them. But I just wanted to show you this example, which is in the Dulwich College archives. And this is the only cranium that we have. So this is the only sort of part of the skull that you know looks like well, looks like one of these, in fact. Um, so what you would um, identify when you see uh, a, a bone, you can identify that this is some sort of large carnivore in a way, perhaps that if you just saw a piece of elbow or a toe, you are not going to be quite um, so sure of what you're looking at. But so this specimen in the Dulwich College archive is the only skull cranium specimen that we have. Um, but we've got other bits of bone. We've got, in fact, most body parts of the animals are represented within the deposits from Southwark.
OK, so we've got their bones. What happens to them? So we've got these bears, they're alive, they're being attacked by dogs for human entertainment. What happens when they're dead? Well, if we look at this bone, which is actually a piece of a hip bone, so it's the top part of the hip, and you can see that it's got all of these little sort of crenellations. It's got these little um, zigzaggy edges all the way along the bottom part, and that is an indication of gnawing. So this bone has been gnawed by another animal, probably a dog, um, and so it's sort of a, it's a circular economy. You've got dogs coming in that are being um, fighting the bear. The bear will be killing some of them, but on occasion the bear will be killed and that bear is then being fed back to the dogs. So they're basically um, saving money and um, uh, feeding is a circular sort of feeding. Um, so what about the dogs then? What do we know about them? Well, here in the Agas map from 1561, we can actually see the dogs in their kennels. Um, and we know from archival records that James I ordered that dogs should be kept on Bankside, that they should be bred, that female mastiffs should be kept and bred so that there were enough dogs for the baiting. Because in terms of baiting, you know, dogs are going to die more frequently than the bears. And so the dogs are present in Southwark, and this is an example of one of uh, the dog skulls that, that have been found. And um, it's about 20 centimetres long, so it's a pretty large dog. And we can tell all sorts of things about it. So, so part of this project is to construct osteobiographies. And for this dog, for example, with its DNA, we can, we can find out what sex it is. So is it a male or a female dog? We can um, look at its size. We can compare it to other dogs of the same period. Is it larger or smaller than, than the typical early modern dog? We can look at its bone and tooth chemistry and look at its diet. So can we see that it's eating the bears? How, do they, how does the diet of the different animals within the um, deposits from the arenas relate to one another? We can look at their tooth chemistry to see to some extent, whether this dog was born in Southwark or had been moved in there from somewhere else. And we have archival records that suggest that dogs are being imported to London for the baiting. So can we see that um, in their teeth? We can also, uh, with the wonders of modern ancient DNA, look at the coat colour of these animals. And that feeds into questions about um, the baiting um, and the spectacle of baiting. So do we only have black dogs or brown dogs fighting, you know, might that be a thing? It's all uniform animals. Or do we have different coloured dogs? So we've got, you know, a, a spotty dog, we've got a white dog, we've got a black dog. And that does that make baiting easier? So you can you can uh, bet on the, on the black dog and that way you know which, you know, whether you've been successful or not. These are all questions that we can't necessarily get at, but certainly by examining the histories of the animals, we can get at an idea of what was happening in terms of of the overall picture, but also give these animals some identity in a way that they haven't had um, when they've sort of been lost in the literature. Now, visualising bear baiting, I've shown you a couple of examples, um, but these are, these are slightly later ceramics, so from about 1750s onwards, made in Staffordshire and Nottinghamshire. We've got brown salt glazed uh, bears, which are made in uh, uh, Nottinghamshire, and these white ones, which are said to be made in Staffordshire. And what it shows is a chained and muzzled bear, bear baiting, holding a dog in its paws. So this is a depiction of bear baiting, uh, and it is squishing that dog. Uh, and they come in all sorts of uh, forms and shapes and sizes. But what's interesting is 1550s, 1560s, going up until, in fact, the 1820s, this is when bear baiting is supposed to be in decline. And yet these items are being made to be sold. And so people are buying these. And if bear baiting is in decline and people don't like doing it, why are these still on the sale? Why are these an attractive thing to buy? So that's, a, that's an interesting question. But also I'd like, there are interesting gender aspects involved in uh, baiting, which I'm about to move on to. And I'd just like you to uh, look at this bear. And if you look just beneath the dog, you can see that the potter intended this to be read as a male bear. Um, and that's quite interesting because are they male or are they female? Well, if we look at some of the names of the bears that we get that have come out of the archives, and there's quite a number of bears named, 
we can see that there's lots of different animals. Uh, these are just a few examples. Tom Hunks, George Stone, Kate of Kent, Blind Bess. So we do have named female bears. So are those female bears being baited? You know, women aren't on stage, but do we have do we have female bears on stage? What about Sackerston? He's there. Um, so, you know, these, this named bear that we saw in that play in, in The Merry Wives of Windsor, he's also well known as a bear. But why have they got names? Is it affection? I mean, these animals probably last for quite a long time unless they're very unlucky. So do people go back again and again because it's a particular bear that's on display that weekend and they know that bear and they like it, so they go to it? Or does it just make it easier to bet a bit like horse racing? You know, it's got a personality by giving it a name like Blind Bess or Ned of Canterbury. You've got something to identify with and something to bet on. And when we think about bears and these named bears, the best parallel I've been able to think of is with sort of Roman gladiators. They're expensive. They are highly trained. Their owners do not want them to die because they're going to have to start training up somebody new and it is expensive. So although they are fighting in what could end up with their deaths, that's not what's actually wanted. It's about the spectacle. It's about people coming and seeing um, these fights, but not necessarily ending with the death of the star. Now, sometimes it will happen, and perhaps that's part of it. It's that frizzle. Are you coming? Are you going to be there the day that Sackerston dies? Then you can tell your new friends that you were there the day Sackerston dies. So there's that, there's always that chance, that jeopardy that this is the day when that particular animal may not make it. Um, so is, is there some sort of parallel with gladiators purely in that sense? Now, I've mentioned James I. Baiting had you know, went through all levels and strata of society. It had royal patronage and Henslow and Allen paid £450 to become the masters of the king's bears, bulls and massive dogs. That gave them the right to provide people with licenses to bait across the country. And there must have been a reason why they wanted it. This was the second time they'd gone for it and they finally got it in 1604. So whether it was financial, whether it's prestige, whether it's both, there has to be something happening in baiting that is more than simply sort of violence and animal cruelty. Which also makes me, brings me on to um, just to mention that it's not just brown bears we're talking about. We're also talking about polar bears. And here we've got a quotation from uh, 1623. They turned a white bear into the Thames where they baited him swimming, which was the best sport of all. Now, if you remember, I mentioned those plays from 1610, 1611, which um, suddenly started having bears in again. Now, in 1609, James I was gifted two bear cubs that had been captured near Svalbard. Did one of them survive long enough to become the white bear that was baited in 1623? We don't know, but there's certainly more than just brown bears being baited, there do appear to have been some polar bears baited as well, because those polar bears were being kept at Southwark um, by the masters of the bears. So who went to the baiting then? Well, everybody, monarchs and ambassadors, students and apprentices, tradesmen, but also women. And that's interesting because if you think about blood sports and if you read about blood sports, you will often find that it's a masculine practice and it, women are excluded. But in terms of animal baiting and in terms of bear baiting, women are present. Women are active in bear baiting. So we have um, an example, one being prosecuted for being present uh, uh, baiting on a Sunday when they should have been at prayer. And another was killed when the bear garden collapsed in the 1580s. So women are also being involved in the baiting. And that's an, another interesting gender aspect that we're going to be exploring. And just finally, thinking about motivations, this is a handbill um, advertising uh, an event, a baiting event that's going to happen. And it's the Gamesters of Essex. They are challenging all comers and they have five dogs at a single bear for five pounds. Now, where is that five pounds going? Is that what they have uh, challenged? You know, do if their dogs win, they get the five pounds? Do you bet against their dogs? And if, if they lose, you win the five pounds? 
Not quite sure, but it's clear that there's some aspect of betting going on here that needs exploring. It also, they're going to also weary a bull dead at the stake. So there was a bear baiting happening, there was a bull baiting happening, and the bull was not going to survive. And at the bottom, it also mentions whipping the blind bear. So there's a number of different entertainments on offer on this occasion. Um, but we've got chaps bringing their dogs to fight. So we've got aspects of masculinity here. And if you read about modern dog fighting and modern dog um, baiting, then it, there is very much an, a, a current of masculinity running through it. We've also got aspects of power with the monarchs being involved. We've got economy. Where is the money? Who's, who's um, in charge? And also about staging because we don't want the bear to die. So it has to be some sort of staged event in order to ensure that the dogs don't actually kill the bear every time. So there's all sorts of things happening here. It's not simply a case of violence. And just moving on, just to bring it back to the present day, while bear baiting has been long gone, it was made illegal in 1835, it hasn't been forgotten. And unfortunately, a couple of years ago, there was this example in the press of a TV show being described as a human bear baiting. And that description only works because we all have some sort of implicit feeling of what that might mean, what that might be. Um, and yet, it's nearly 200 years since it was made illegal, but we're still making reference to it. And we've also got examples of the bear pit now, the bear pit is something slightly different in menageries where bears were kept, but it's also a, a, a sort of byword for rough and tumble and um, not a great place to be. Bringing it back up to date, certainly hasn't been forgotten in Southwark, there are place names that entirely relate back to and refer to uh, bear gardens, as you see here on this sign in Southwark today. So these activities from 400 years ago are still very much referenced in the geography of London now. So to conclude then, it was clearly very popular. Much of the evidence and much of the work that's been done so far has been documentary and largely in relation to the playhouses. The archaeological evidence comes from the remains of the animals themselves and the sites of the playhouses and the rebating arenas in Bankside in Southwark in London. Pulling together the archival records and the faunal remains will provide us with much more insight into the practice of bear baiting and we're putting animals at the centre of the story by telling their stories as well. And I think it's really important to to reflect on the fact that baiting isn't just about violence. It's very easy for us, and, and I mean, it is about violence and it's about animal cruelty, but it was an integral part of early modern entertainment and economy. It was much, much more than simply dogs attacking a bear. And that's me done, thank you.